Greetings, everyone. I'm Pastor Joel Pledge from Crossroads Assembly of God in Three Way, Tennessee. We're right here in the heart of West Tennessee, not far from Jackson, Humboldt, and Medina. We invite you to be with us if you live in our area. If not, we're glad that you joined us on this Facebook Live broadcast. If you're watching by YouTube, we thank the Lord for you as well. We praise the Lord for the opportunity to come into your life and to speak God's Word to you. Today, we're going to be talking from... Um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, it's a very simple verse. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And we're going to look at that word comfort and what that means and what God is going to do in our lives. Before we do, we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to have a scripture reading from Mark chapter 6 and open with prayer. God bless you as you listen. Saturday evening, when Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, went out to purchase burial spice so that they could anoint Jesus' body. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way, they, asked, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us to enter the tomb? But as they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled aside. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in white robes sitting on the right side. The women were shocked, but an angel said, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where he lay his body. Now go tell his disciples, including people, Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there, just as you told you before he died. The woman fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. Father, thank you for the resurrection of Jesus. Thank you that we have a confirmation that our sins are forgiven, that Jesus has conquered death and the grave. Thank you, Lord, that you go beyond our plans and expectations. Though the disciples had heard the teaching of the resurrection, that, they, that we're not expecting the resurrection, they were living in doubt and fear, separated from your promises. But thanks be to God, for his wonderful gifts. You have a plan and worked out that the plans in our lives and death of your son, Jesus, work out your plans in our lives. Do the unexpected in us, do the miracles in us. We are believing today for miracles. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Your heart is 
time All your goodness I will keep on singing Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Bless the Lord of my soul His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord of my soul. Oh, my soul, worship His holy. morning. I'm in a series, and my series is The Secret of Happiness, and we're on the Sermon on the Mount, and beginning with the Beatitudes, because this is where Jesus gives to us those famous words of blessed are those who, and you can fill in the blank there from the Beatitudes, but the word blessed means happy. Um, it is a spiritual happiness. It is a deep joy that God gives to us, and that's God's view of our lives. I want to just ask you what makes you happy this morning, and and in doing so, we'll we'll give to you a few images that uh, may speak to your happiness. Okay, uh, first of all, maybe it's a house or a new car or just things in general. Maybe it's that uh, vacation to that special place, or maybe it's a a house full of new furniture. Maybe it's a boat. You know, the list could go on and on. These Four people there, they have money in their piggy bank, so maybe that's what makes them happy. I think if you ask the American, uh, average American somewhere, one of those things is going to be uh, what they want. I'll show you some images here of what uh, biblically uh, an Israelite might have wanted. Well, 
you can tell it's a little different. But they, if they looked out of their window, their kitchen, they would have wanted to see a, a vineyard and a fig tree. I believe I would have added an olive tree in there somewhere along the line. Um, and these images just show you this is um, very common in the nation of Israel. And it's because of 1 Kings chapter 4, and verse 25, And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his own vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. <laughs> well, this is a, um, a, a reality for us. This is what made them happy. They didn't have to have the biggest house. They didn't have to have the, the, the new car or the new boat. I'm sure that some people did. But I also know that, that they had a simple desire. God, give me my own piece of property. Give me my own house, my own vineyard, my own fig tree. Those things uh, would, would have, have defined what happiness was for the Israelites. You know, it makes it into our American culture by, by my means of George Washington. I, um, I found this quote from him as he retires. It's a great quote. It says, For once uh, I am once more seated under my own vine and fig tree and hope to spend the remainder of my days in peaceful retirement, making political pursuits yield to the more rational amusements of cultivating the earth. So even in our, uh, in, in our nation, there is that foundation of this is what we want. My own house, my own piece of property, my own vineyard, my own fig tree, those things that give me great joy. Our beatitude today, however, speaks of a different reality. Okay? It speaks of a different reality. The, the verse of Scripture is, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Oh, this image of happiness is interrupted by this, this text. Blessed are those who mourn. Happy are those who mourn. I do think of I took a poll this morning that, that again, living in that house with a good view and a uh, without threats or without brokenness, without uh, bad health, this would be one of the images in which would speak to true happiness. And yet we know, as this verse tells us, there will be times of mourning. Our life is not yet eternal for our bodies or our minds. <laughs> There's going to be disruptions in our dreams and our visions. There's going to be loss that's going to come, the loss of those that we love, loss of health and strength, perhaps the loss of mobility. The question, the questions that the Beatitudes answer today is, well, does this mean, this morning, does this mean that happiness is impossible? Does my loss mean that mourning and sorrow and despair are without end? So, does your loss mean that life is essentially over for you? Is there a happiness available to you? Jesus would answer that question in this beatitude. He would say, no, wait, there is comfort to those who have endured that great loss. There's comfort to those who mourn. Amen? There is comfort to those who mourn. Comfort to those who have had that great loss. In the light of this reality um, of suffering in this life, that God points us to the promise of eternity. Hear me now. Eternal life is real. There is such a place called heaven. There is a God who dwells there. There is a resurrection body for us, a place prepared for us to enter in. We may mourn those who have departed us by death. We may mourn their suffering. We may mourn our loss of their company. We may mourn the injustice of the loss. Perhaps they were just too young to die. Perhaps they died in a tragic accident, or perhaps they died in tragic circumstance, and we mourn. 
Yet Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13, he says this. He says, now, dear brothers, I don't, we want you to know that what will happen to believers who have died so that you do not grieve or will not grieve like the people who have no hope. <laughs> Amen. And verse 18 says, so encourage one another with these words. But let me hold that for just a second. In these verses, he proceeds to tell them that Jesus is coming. He describes the reality that, that there is coming a day and when, when, in which the dead in Christ will rise from the dead. We who are alive and remain, if we are alive and remain, will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Forever we will be with the Lord. And he ends that with those words that I showed you. So encourage one another with these words. Amen. Well, listen, that word encourage is that same word that Jesus used in that beatitude for comfort. Encourage, comfort one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. The revelation of the end times for us, as simple as Paul puts it, uh, Jesus is coming again. Don't grieve, don't grieve like everybody else. That person laid in that grave is not lost forever. We will see them again. Do not mourn as if you'll never see them. Do not mourn as if they're gone forever because we will be reunited with them. Hallelujah. This is a promise, a comfort that God gives to us. You know, I, I'll complete this thought by going to the book of Revelation because Revelation 21, verse, uh, verses 3 and following are so powerful. As it says this, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look. God's home is now among his people. Hallelujah. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow. That's the word mourning there. Or crying or pain. All these things are gone for ever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, again, that word sorrow is the word mourning found in Matthew 5 and 4. We find this in the last chapter of the book of the Bible. This is a promise of comfort to us. No more death, no more sorrow, no more crying or pain. This is the ultimate victory that we have over death. There is no more grief. There is no more pain associated with it. You know, Jesus doesn't preach this entire sermon. I, 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 there's some people who won't even... Uh, who will say, well, Jesus is talking about a spiritual morning, and I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But I'm telling you something. When the Bible talks about mourning, and when, they, when it describes mourning in the Old Testament, it's the mourning of a loss. And when Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, he is saying to us, there's a comfort available to you that goes beyond what this world has. The promise of eternity is a great comfort to us. A comfort uh, that, that breaks our sadness and brings us into the spiritual reality of his presence and his joy. Now, Jesus came for this very purpose. Mm -hmm. He came to release us from our sins. He came to invite us to this eternal life. He came to invite us into his presence where the sorrow, the mourning of this life Oh, this short, short life that is just a vapor that appears and is gone. The morning of this life will be comforted by the reality of eternity. There's a second type of comfort that God gives to us. That he will comfort those who recognize the sinfulness of the world. Sometimes, but not all times, the bad things that happen in life are a result of sin. Okay, It could be our sin. It could be the sin of your family. It could be the sin of the nation. There are obvious exceptions in the scripture, Jesus being the first and foremost, because Jesus didn't suffer what he suffered because of his own sin. He, he did suffer because of our sin, but not his own sin. Job was one who was a righteous man, and yet he suffered. It wasn't his own sin. 
with something else. On the other hand, when we look at the history of Israel, we would recognize that they are well known to suffer because of sin. They had a cycle. <laughs> they had a cycle. They lived for God for a little while, and they began to drift. As they began to drift, God to let their, their, their enemies come against them and, uh, and began to dominate them. And then they would come to repentance and say, oh, God, deliver us, and we'll throw away our idols, and we'll, we'll once again worship you. And, and God restores them and restores them, and then they come back again, and they begin to drift away, and, 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 and there's sin. <laughs> it was a cycle. The prophecies concerning the Messiah in Isaiah 61 are the promise of restoration, the promise of God's comfort. Let me read those to you because these are important words. Okay? Because these are these are the these are the prophecy concerning Jesus, the Messiah of Isaiah, of Isaiah 61. This is what Jesus claimed to be doing claim to come to do. These are the claims that he read in the synagogue in Nazareth, um, declaring as he, as, he, as he began his ministry, this is what I am here for. This is why I'm here. And uh, he said this. This is what he wrote or what he said. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and the prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor is come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he'll give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will look like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. We can see, if you understand the context again, where Israel was in this cycle, they were dominated by their enemies. So they had poverty. They had a broken heart. They were captives. They were prisoners. And as this, this, these all were, were, were because of their sin and because they had abandoned God and an enemy had come. An enemy had come. They were reaping the harvest of what they had sown. Yet we come to those words. It's, it's important for us to, to, to understand verse 2. He has sent me, Jesus says, to tell those who mourn, there's that word again, that the time of the Lord's favor has come, and with it the day of God's anger against his enemies. Do you hear those words? Do you hear those words? <laughs> Hallelujah. He's talking to a particular people here. Listen, he's speaking to the righteous. He's speaking to those who who have seen the sin of the nation and have cried out in repentance, in sackcloth, in ashes. These are symbols. They, they put on sackcloth. And, um, they put on a, a clothing that was uncomfortable to wear. Okay? It was uncomfortable. It made them uncomfortable. And, and it, it represented the, the condition of their soul. They put ashes on their head as, as a symbol of their mourning. Okay, something disastrous has happened to them. They are covered in ash. And, and, and uh, uh, there, there is those things. And God is saying to that righteous remnant, I've heard your prayers. I've seen your mourning. Now I've come to restore you. Your mourning has been heard. Your mourning has been seen. And I'm going to answer your prayers. The comfort that God gives to Israel at this moment and through the ministry of the Messiah is the restoration of Israel to its rightful place among the nations. Israel is in this, in this passage. They are poor and brokenhearted and captives of another people. 
and God says, I'm going to change that. Verse 9 of that, of that chapter says this, everyone will realize that they are a people the Lord has blessed. <laughs> Amen? Well, that's a great change, but it can only happen through the restoration of God. The comfort of God is not just in the wiping of our tears. It's not just in the holding of our hands so that we can compose ourselves. It is an action of deliverance, of restoration, of the impartation of his blessing that changes our lives. Let's go to chapter 62 because it continues the theme. Verse 2 says this, the nations will see your righteousness and world leaders will be blinded by your glory and you'll be given a new name by the Lord's own mouth. Verse 4, uh, uh, verse four says, Never again will you be called the forsaken city or the desolate land. Can you hear them saying that about Israel or about Jerusalem? Your new name will be the city of God's delight, the bride of God. For the Lord delights in you and will claim you as his own bride. The Lord has sworn by Jerusalem, to Jerusalem by his own strength, I will never again hand you over to your enemies. Never again will foreign warriors come and take away your grain and your new wine. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm way over in my... Uh, in my conversations here, but do you hear those words? These are words of restoration. He's going to restore the nation to its rightful place. No longer a prisoner, no longer a captive, no longer brokenhearted, no longer living in poverty. God is going to bring restoration to them. He's going to say, you, they used to say about Jerusalem, it was a city of desolation, but now you're going to be called the delight of God, uh, the, the city of God's delight and the bride of now, we know this has fulfillment in the New Testament as, a, as that verse that you saw just briefly there in Revelation 21 and 9. Behold, when then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls containing the last seven plagues came and said to me, Come with me. I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Amen. Hallelujah. There it is, the New Testament fulfillment of the promise of Isaiah 62. There is, we are going to be called the bride of the Lamb, the bride of God. How beautiful is that restoration? Here in Revelation, we know is the description in chapter 22 of this great city of great wealth laid on the foundation of 12 precious stones and having 12 gates uh, made of, of, of pearl, each one a single pearl, un, un, impossible in today's world, isn't it? Listen, this, it, this city has streets of, of, of gold. It is for us this image of God's love and restoration in our lives, the ultimate restoration. I don't want you to miss the very fact that the church is, is, is mentioned here. Isaiah 60, 61 is the ministry of the Messiah, and he is sent to the people of Israel. But he enlarges his ministry to touch the church, to touch the entire world. And Isaiah 62 points to that reality. It does so by, by, by the verses, these verses. Isaiah verse 11, the, the Lord has sent this message to every land. Tell the people of Israel, look, your Savior is coming. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. And this is the promise, not the promise, but this is the mandate given to the church. We are to go into all the world and preach this gospel. We are to go and say there's a Savior coming. His reward is with him. If you serve him, there's going to be great reward. It's called eternal life with God. If you don't serve him, there's a hell awaiting you. You must abandon your, your, your sin and come to the Lord. There is no doubt in my mind. There's no doubt in my mind that God is calling, the, uh, sending us to the world with that message. Their Savior is coming. Amen? The Savior is coming. Oh, um, let, me, let me ask you this all-important question because 
this this section is about mourning for the sins of the people. Have you ever mourned for the sins of your city? Have you ever mourned for the sins of your state or your nation or our world? Have you ever been brokenhearted because of the sins that you see around you? Ever driven past that bar and said, oh God, oh God, how terrible the sin. Have you ever stood in line where, where that, that man, that, that man with nothing is buying lottery tickets and in hopes of hitting it big? And wept because that's not where restoration, where true happiness comes from. Have you ever wept when you drove down the street and the in the in the rich houses, the million dollar homes are there, and and you said to yourself, I wonder if they're trusting in their riches. How many of you have been brokenhearted? You know, the promise of God to us, the promise of God to us um, is, is that we, we, we would exchange. Um, he will give us a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing because of our mourning. There it is, the joyous blessing because of our mourning and a festive praise because of despair. But that promise is made to the believer who recognizes the sin of this world. The sin that has brought poverty and brokenness and captivity. That sin that offends the heart of God. And that you have fasted and you've prayed because of the sins of the world around you. And you've repent so that God will come and bring salvation to his people. Now we call this intercession, we call it an intercession for the lost, an intercession for the world. It, it's, it's a call and a prayer for repentance among the people. You know, it's the, it's the intercession of, a, of an Abraham as he prays for Sodom and Gomorrah, please Lord, spare that city. It's the intercession for Mo, of Moses as God says to him, I'm just going to destroy them. They've worshipped a an, a calf as a god, or as a golden calf as God, an idol, and they're calling him God. And and Moses says, "Don't destroy them! Don't destroy them! Don't destroy them!" It's the intercession of Jesus as he looks down upon the city of Jerusalem. He says, "Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem! Oh, how I wanted to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks." Oh, I want to protect you. Oh, I want to look after you. Oh, I want to provide for you. Have you ever had that experience? God's calling us, my friends, to, to pray for the lost, to pray for our city, our state, this world in which we live. Let me, um, let me take this one step into, into a more personal level. As I said uh, or earlier, that sin sometimes happens because of sin. Uh, bad things happen because of sin. Sometimes because of our sin, sometimes because of the sin of others. And there's times that bad things happen just because that's what enemies do. They attack. Okay. They attack and they steal. They destroy. We become brokenhearted and captive because the enemy has come to destroy us. That's just what enemies do. So when you hear these verses of Isaiah 61 and 62, you've got to hear the promise of the Lord for your life because your comfort comes not just as the presence of the Lord comes to be with you and calms your heart and grants peace in a time of trouble, but God's comfort comes in the form of restoration. There's a breaking of the poverty in your life. There's a healing of the broken hearted. There's the setting free of those who are bound. 
These are the promises of God to us. This is the ministry of Jesus. This is why he came. This is the promise of God to us, to you, to your families. And I encourage you to stand upon that promise of God. These are not just words, empty words being spoken by Jesus. This is his ministry. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to accomplish this very thing. So I stand upon it today for you, and I encourage you to stand upon it today. Lord, your anointing breaks the poverty. Your anointing heals my broken heart. Your anointing sets me free. Hallelujah. Stand upon the word of God, because Jesus has come to change our lives. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Well, let me... Let me give you to this last point, that comfort comes to those who recognize their own sinfulness, their own sinfulness. Let's go to James chapter 4, and let's read those verses. What's causing quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you do ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You only want what will give you pleasure. You adulterers. Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world... You make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. And he gives grace generously. As the scripture says, he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Well, these words are spoken to a backslidden congregation. You can tell that they have drifted away from the Lord and they've become friends of the world. They've become friends with their wealth and their business and their their own families. And and so uh, they have... um, They have backslid. These are people who are living afar off from God. Jealousy has caused them to fight one another. Their motives are wrong. They're only asking for things from God that will uh, increase their own pleasure, feed their own evil desires. James calls them to repent, to return to God in humility. I'd read that as being poor in spirit, in humility. Verse 9 gives to us the... what, God, what, what James is, is, is calling for and asking for, he says, let there be tears for what is done. Let there be sorrow. Hmm. Well, that's the same word, mourning, that we have in our beatitude. Let there be mourning and deep grief. Let there be sadness. Again, a repeat of that word, mourning, instead of laughter and gloom, instead of joy. Hallelujah. You know, Comfort comes to us in the form of God's grace, his favor, which was promised all the way back in Isaiah 61. Comfort comes in the form of of forgiveness and restoration in our relationship with God. Comfort comes in the presence of of the Almighty. We come to him. We we turn to him. we, We come close to God, and the devil flees from us. What a great comfort that God gives to us. Comfort comes in being lifted up by God. As as our, um, um, as Isaiah 6, 9, everyone will realize that they are people the Lord has blessed. Listen, there may be some today who are listening who have been overcome by sin. 
He didn't plan on it. He didn't say, well, I'm just going to drift away from God. But day by day, those things happen. Little by little, we, we step away from God. And pretty soon, we find ourselves in a completely different place than what we intended. And we become overwhelmed by the enemy, overwhelmed by our own sin. You've become a friend of the world instead of being a friend of God. Matter of fact, you've become an enemy of God. That's what James said, an enemy of God. And you need to repent and you need to return to God. John described the Laodicean church and as he's listening to that story, their testimony was, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And Jesus said, no, 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 you're poor and wretched and blind and you need to return to me. You need to return to me. Jesus was knocking on the door of that church and said, if you hear my voice, if you hear me knocking, open the door and I will come in to you and, and fellowship with you. The question is, as Jesus knocks today, are you listening? Are you ready to open the door to him, to be restored to him, to draw near to God so that God can draw near to you? Please understand that repentance is not just saying with our mouth, oh, I'm sorry, God, I've just been busy, or God, I, I just had a lot of things on my plate, and yeah, I can't come to church, and, but you know, oh God, I'm, I'm sorry. Did you see that description? Did you see that description? Let me show it to you once more. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be mourning and deep grief. Let there be mourning instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. I pray that you'll come to that place where you see that you've offended God. You've walked away from him. The one who is trying, not trying, but giving you his grace and restoring your life. And you said it's not important. God's calling you today and he will comfort you by restoring you into a right relationship with him. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word today. Truly, we are blessed that even in the midst of difficult circumstances, we have a promise. We have the promise of eternity. We have the promise of life with you throughout eternity. And I give you praise for that, and I thank you for the promise. I thank you for the promise of restoration, that you will comfort our lives by your grace, by the abundance of that grace and the power of that grace to change and transform our lives. I also thank you, Lord, this morning for the comfort that comes to those who have walked away, for those who do not know you, for those who have offended you by their actions. God, I pray that you will restore them, that you will comfort them in your grace, with your forgiveness, with your restoration. And I bless you and I thank you in that wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's been a joy to be with you today. We're praying God's great blessing upon you as you as you go. Let me just put a few things on here. You know, uh, our website, uh, CRAGonline.com. You can find some of the messages. On, I'm hoping to post these messages on the Beatitudes this week, so they'll be there. Uh, you can also give from that website, just uh, on one of the tabs on giving at the top of the of the top of the page. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your gift, and your offerings. Um, what a great blessing! We're praying, Lord, uh, praying for you. God greatly bless you. Amen. Amen.